and we've reached the end. This is the last of the videos. This is number three of three. And this one's longer than the other ones. In here, you'll find an explanation of modular setups. We'll revisit the scatters. We'll talk about those again. We'll talk about the instances and instance hierarchies. We'll talk about the infection solver being a modular system inside of Bifrost, which means I only had to build it once, but I got to use it six or seven times. That's the real point of this whole workshop, is building things in sections and reusing them and reusing them. So we'll be talking about secondary infections and tertiary infections and all kinds of good stuff like that. This is the deepest of the dives and it's also pulling it all together for the final output and being sent off to the renderer. There's a lot of caching in here too. We cache our points over and over and over again. We'll do something to the points and we'll cache it. That, that's the kind of the whole point. So sit back, get ready to follow along if you're following along or grab some popcorn if you're not and I'll see you at the end. Cheers. So you can see the wind field is just making the grass gently sway, which is exactly what we want to do. From here, we're going to move on to putting our scatter points on this grass field. And once that's done, we are pretty much ready to start scattering our crystal growth and build our infection solver. Let's let this play through one more time. So at this point in time, we have, if you remember from when we started, we have all of our points here, our house, our trunk, etc., etc., etc. It's coming in from another file from here, and I can just show that. Really quickly hide everything else. So we have all of our points here, except for the, no the notable exception of our grass. There's no points scattered on our grass ready to accept crystals. So let's get that done, and then we can start working on how we're going to make them infect each other. Let's turn the grass off for now. We don't need to calculate that all the time. The easiest way to do this is, once this has generated a single mesh, what I'm doing here is I'm scattering on top of it again. The points out port here is taking the 36 times however many times around the loop we go, which is in this case four, the 36 points and going out. The plan here is to take all of these points and do this to them again. We're instancing two things. We're instancing the main meshes, which is the grass, the reed, and the maiden grass. And then we'll be instancing the points as well, because you can do that. I can take the points and then instance them out exactly the same way this is done. In fact, it's done by copying and pasting this, which I will, I will show you guys. And then I can apply the same wind field to them. And at the end, I have another set of points that are moving with the grass. So that's actually a module in and of itself. It's it's a scattering and instancing module. So, I mean, I could put this into a compound and then just copy and paste things. So I could put all of that into a compound and just copy and replace it. But what I'm going to do is leave it out at the moment. I'm going to make things a little messier by doing that. So we'll have a couple of these and, and this will start to get a little bit full. Because I need it to be available for any tweaking or troubleshooting, which hopefully there won't be any because you know, this is not the first time I've done this, then it's all right there laid out. I don't have to keep diving into compounds and things like that. We'll tidy it all up at the end. So the job now is to get some points out. The other thing I'm going to tell you right now is we're going to need to cache a lot of these points. If we take a look at how many points we have on the ground, we have 44,000 points. If we take a look at how many points we have entirely, we have 172,000 points before the grass goes in. Also, a good tip is always remove your watch points, they slow things down. We have tens of thousands of points here that we are scattering meshes on, which is of course what this is. So now we're proposing to scatter between 36 and 48 points on every single one of these as well. And right now we are, we're only outputting the strands right now for visibility. So I think what we'll do now is we will scatter on each of these meshes. These two are already, already there, we just need to do the grass. Once that's done, I'll show you how to put together a point cache to disk. All right, so let's dive into the grass and see what's going on. We are outputting the mesh. There we go. That's the mesh coming out, and I'm making it a mesh by extruding the strand. Some of the tips of these grasses are possibly a bit fat, so let's go and edit that real fast. You remember we had these F curves here for controlling the shape of our grass. What I need to do is come into these and pull these down, and you should be able to see the grass just getting narrower at the end. But now what we can do very easily is we will just absolutely copy what we have here. So all this is doing is a blue noise scatter, which means it's more regularly spaced along the object, with a seed coming from the current index. So you're getting a different scatter pattern each time. Let's jump into the grass and quickly set that up.
that, that is essentially done. What we need to do now is let's take a look at these points. So let's first off, let's just merge them. If we like, let's just put down another one of our display compounds that we made. Pop that into it. I'm going to turn the grass off real quickly. So you can see what it's doing here. Those are the grass strands. I believe those are the reeds. And looking at that, that's the maiden grass. So what it's doing is it's scattering these points on the things we're instancing. And what that means is, let's get rid of the display, that I can take all of that, copy it, and paste it. Let's just move it down so we've got a bit of room to work. And you can see it's a direct copy of what I've been doing on the other side. And what we need to do now is just replace what was going into the selector instance and the create instances. So first off, we'll put in the points for the grass, then the points for the reed, and the points for the maiden grass go in here, and this gets put in as an instance. And because we've copied everything, all of this should just follow through. Of course, that's famous last words, so let's have a look after the compute on frame and just see what we get. So after some tweaking, here's what we get. You can see that some are higher than others. Those are the maiden grass and the reeds sticking up, but mostly it's just the grass. If I jump over to my perspective view, we can zoom in and take a closer look. They're really just points at the moment. What I was getting wrong, of course, is I was trying to look at the merged mesh and I needed to look at the merged points. So here, here we are at the merged points. There are 2 million points here. It'll just take itself a little while to sort that out. Just over 2 million points. Which means at this point, we really need to talk about caching to disk. Because I can now, you can already see the slowness that's happening here. So what we've done here is we've taken everything, cached it on the first frame, all 2 million of the points, and then applied the same wind field as we did up here. Now, this is only going to work if the points are carrying a point ratio with them, and these ones do. So let's see how the wind field works. You can see not much is going on at the moment, but there is movement there, and the speed we're getting is all due to this compute on frame. You can see them slowly moving in there playing back quite quickly, and that's as baked and with the cache on first frame or only computing on the first frame. Let's get a bit of a display going and see what we can see. So here we go. We have the points that will be instancing our crystals on the grass now, and we can take a look at how well they match with the movement. Yes, they're screamingly pink and the grass is mostly green. That is, of course, why I've done it, so we can see it. I might need to put the size just down a little bit so we get more of an idea. There we go. And you can see there's a little bit of an offset going on here, which is something we'll need to fix. And I believe I know what that is. But for now, let's just play it and see what happens. So what's happening here is that the grass is moving, but the points are not. When we've scattered on the grass, we're scattering on each mesh that we're generating. And what I didn't do that I should have done is transferred the point ratio property onto the points. Right now it's just transferring the point normal. So inside the scatter points, you can choose which properties you need to transfer from the object that you're scattering onto onto the points themselves. And I needed to transfer point ratio as well. And you can see here that they just jumped straight onto the blades. Let's just remove that watch point jump out of there and have a quick look at how fast they're moving and whether they're matching the grass blades when they move. And that's what we need to do. That's the final scattering done. We're going to be scattering our crystals on there. We're going to be building a growth solver or an infection solver that will control which points have crystals and how big those crystals are. Even though we're getting good playback time, we're starting to really slow down. We're down to about 1.7 frames per second. I'm in no way expecting this to be real time. We can get this faster, and we need to get this faster before we start building our infection solver. So the time has come to tidy up just a little bit, and then we're going to cache. 
so I'm going to show you how to build a really quick Bifrost point cache. Let's just start tidying this up really quickly. So what we've got here is a couple of modules and the nicest way to tidy them up is probably just to put them in a compound. The thing is there are some things we want left exposed and they're mainly the wind field. And since we'll be caching after the wind field, I think that's a good place to not include things in the new compound. So let's make a compound out of these. All of those modules for instancing on our base points, which are the ones down at the bottom, have now been included into two new compounds or two new modules. So here's our wind field. And what we need to do before we do anything else is to get these points cached out. Bifrost provides some tools to do that. File cache is the first one, but I tend not to use this. So what we'll do really, really quickly is we will build our own cache system. This is the basis of a point cache node. So we have our input coming in from the outside. And this is the, let's rename this quickly, geodecache. So the things we need to cache something is we need to know if it's reading or writing, the file name that we're going to cache it to, and the directory it's going to be cached in. So if I go to my cache directory, I already have one called Bob. Let's make a new folder in here. And I'm going to make another new folder in here. This is going to become our directory. So that gets popped in there, just like that. Then we need to give this a file name. So I'm going to call this moving grass. And now I need to put in dot hash 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 dot bob. What, what this is telling the nodes inside here to do is to write the caches to that directory, call them all moving grass, and the four hashes put in a frame. This will not work unless it is hooked up to an output, so to cache this I'm going to need to play it through all the way. Also, it's going to cache as an array, which is fine. It will be an array of one object in this particular case. You can put multiple objects in if you wish. We're only putting one object in, so we're only going to, we're going to get an array of one out. So it's pretty easy to just do first an array. So let's write this. I'll pause the video and come back when it's written. Okay, so here it is cached. You can see that there's nothing coming into the object. Write is off and I have all of my file name and directory set up as well as caching out the point position because that's what I'm going to need. You can see if I just skip ahead that it moves. So that's the major cache we needed to do. We're going to need to cache some more now. We're going to need to cache all of these separately and we will be running an infection solver on them. I will cache them separately now that you know how to do it. Feel free to take another good look in here. Pause the video and take a look. To get the infection started, let's build the infection solver just for the ground point. So in the name of speed, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this connection here so we're not trying to redraw this cache all the time. And I'm going to pop this guy out to just here for now, to a terminal, there's our ground points. We could even use one of our display nodes. And we'll pop this out to the display. We need two things to make an infection solver. What we need first is we need a number of seed points to start the infection. So that's the thing we'll be building first. After that, we need to build a solver that goes through every point, gets its closest neighbors within a radius, checks how infected they are, calculates an infection value for that point based on how close it is to its neighbors, and then outputs that and goes around the solver again. Sounds horribly complicated. It's really not that bad. We'll get started by right here and we'll make a compound. What we'll do first of all, before we get into any solvers, is we'll quickly jump in here and generate some seed points. And the reason I need these is I'm going to be doing some random arrays. So we need to decide how we want to generate our seed points. Do we want them to be completely random? Would we like them to be a percentage of this? Or would we like to give the ability to select points to start on? For the ground, I'm going to go with the first two options. So I'll go ahead really quickly and create the random and by chance, and then I'll take you through it. So first off, we'll do a random. Let's get a couple of things going here. We'll get a new compound.
First, I'm going to generate a random chance. For that, I'm going to need a new input. And this is going to be the chance. Now, what I want my users to do, or you guys to do, this is going back out to another department, and they'll need to be able to change things on the Bifrost. So we need to make sure that we can give them as many options as we possibly can without confusing anyone. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, what's this chance going to be? It's going to be a number between zero and one. Zero being no chance, and one being everything is on. So to do that, I'm going to set up a system whereby if this number is a 2% chance, 0 0.02. I need it to reject 98% of all the points. And here's how I'm going to do that. What I'm doing is I'm subtracting that from one. And I'm just making sure that we can't go below zero or above one by installing a clamp here. So at this point in time, the number coming out of here is 0.98. So this has to be greater than something. And for that, we're going to need a random value array. And what this does, it'll generate this many random numbers between zero and one. So what I'm saying here is generate as many random numbers as there are points, because this is our point count, and then see if those numbers are greater than 0.98, which is 1 minus our chance. And then I want to find all of that that's true. So these are the indices that we're getting by chance. We need to choose between, do you want to generate these by chance? If so, what chance do you want to give them? Or do we want to just generate 25 points at random? Let's put in the choice. And if we do want to generate by chance, if this is true, we're going to use these indices because these are generated by chance with this random array. Now, this is probably a little bit bad naming because the other way to do it is also to generate it by chance, but it allows us to specify how many seed points we want. So let's just set up that input. So now we need to do this a little bit of a different way. This is a user input that says, how many seed points do we want? Let's say 100. So what I want to do here, I want to put this into a sequence array. All this is going to do is build a sequence with this number of objects in it. I want this array to also be long integers. And it's going to start at 0 with a step of 1 and go all the way until it hits this. And in this case, it's 100. So this is going to produce an array that starts at zero, then goes one, two, three, four, all the way up to 99. And the reason I'm going to do that is this is going to become the index of a random number. What random value does is a lot like what random array does. It generates a random number between minimum and maximum. Let's make sure those are long integers again. But when you plug an array into the index, it generates this many numbers between this min and this max, because this is the index of the random number it generates. So what we want to do here is have the minimum number be zero, the maximum number be our point count. And this is essentially going to choose this many numbers from that many points. And that's what we want. We want it to randomly choose the number of seeds from the entire array. And in the seed here, I'm just going to put in a random large number, just like that. And I, I can either set up something that will generate a seed, but for one-offs like this, I tend to just put in a large number, make sure no two are the same. We have 100 values between 0 and the number of points. So this will become our false case. These are the numbers generated not by chance. And then we can output that. Great, well on, our, well on our way. We're now generating our seed points. Maybe we should take a look at those seed points. So what the seed points are for are to set the first infection values. So let's get that set up really quickly. This will set up an array with the same number of entries as there are points. And at this point in time, it's setting all of them to default. So I'm just creating the initial infection array. At this point in time, nothing is infected, which is brilliant. And that's, that's exactly where we want to start with no infection on our ground. Now, if I set an array using the indices from our generate seed points and give them a value of one, that sets these indices in this array to this number. So right now we have some points that are infected. Then what I'll need to do is I'll need to set that on our object as a property, and we'll call this property 
infected. And I'm going to create a value node with that so that I have a string infected because I'm going to use it again later. So right now we have our input, which are these ground points. We are setting up our initial infection array, and then we are setting up our seed points to be in that array as values of one. So that means that some points are going to have an infection value of one. All right, it'd be nice if we could have a look at that. So let's quickly have a look at that. All I'm doing here with this color by property, which you can happily recreate, it's very, very simple. I'm showing all of the points that are infected and there is a color representing their infection value, which means if I wanted to set a very high infection value, that color would get brighter or a very low one, that color would get darker. One, one will be good to start with. So as you can see, I'm generating 100 seed points and we're getting some points that are green. If I set this up to 1000, you can see that I've got a thousand seed points now. And this object has around about 44,000 points. To demonstrate the chance, if I switch this on, that's a 2% chance. We might want to go to a much smaller chance, something like that, possibly even smaller. If you wanted to include the ability to change the seed and get a different starting pattern, all you would need to do is output the seed numbers here. So right now, it's a seed of zero. Let's give it a change the seed and you can see them changing their positions and that'll work whether we're by chance or by number. That's just a really quick way to generate seed points. Let's just pop this up out of the way for now. And let's get to work on the infection solver. So before we actually go ahead and build that, we need to talk about what a solver is. And you've seen one in this before. Compute on frame is essentially an object solver where you have an object coming in, live value and the feedback value. What this little icon on the port means is that this is a port feedback. So that if you take a look at this, this set port feedback is connected to feedback value, which means the output value feeds back into the feedback value. And that's really all of a solver is, is that it's, it's an object or a loop that takes its output for the next step in it. And that's what we've been doing with compute on frame. This is the inside of compute on frame. So if the reset frame is equal to the frame that's coming in, then we use whatever's coming in from outside. If it's not equal, so if it's false here, we're going to use this feedback port, which just will go through and around and around and around. So that's the concept of a solver and that's what we're going to build. And there we have it. That's the world's simplest solver. And that's set up so that if our start frame is greater or equal to the current time, so if that is true, we're going to use the feedback. If it's false, we're going to use what's coming in, which basically just allows us to set a start frame. And that's the frame that the frame after everything will be calculated. So I do this so that I can start on frame two or frame five. I tend to leave the first frame to be the setup frame or something just before it. So that's the, the most basic of solvers. Let's pop our object into it and set our start frame to two. We need to work out how will this infection spread. What I want to do is find all of the points within a radius of this point here, this infected point. I want to find its neighbors and I want to read from its neighbors what their infection value is. And then based on how far away they are from this point, I want to average all of those. So it's a weighted average and apply that to my current point. And then I'll move on to this point and get all of its neighbors get the weighted infection values, do the same thing. So I'm going to run through every single point in here, all 44,000 of them, which, you know, has the ability to get very, very slow. Uh, but Bifrost presents us with some tools to help with that. We're going to need to do some sampling, basically. And we're going to use the get points and radius node to do it. Now, if we jump into the get points and radius node, you can see this thing here called an accelerator. And what this does is it sets up, I believe, a KD tree before you do anything so that the lookup, the sampling, is a lot faster. 
is we're going to take our closer to accelerator and we're going to plug our geometry into it before it goes inside the infection cylinder. We'll take our accelerator, plug that in, and we'll plug in this here. So it's got an accelerator port coming in. So that when we do do our lookups, which we're, which we're going to do shortly, it's already got a pre-accelerated setup of these points to look at. And that's going to speed things up a lot because we don't want the solver just building this accelerator over and over and over again, which is what would, would happen if we just used get point and radius inside there. It would build that accelerator. So let's jump inside. Everything that's going to happen is going to happen inside here between the if and the output because this part of the graph is just re for resetting the port feedback state so that if we want to reset the solver we just go back to before the, the start frame and it'll reset. So everything happens between here and here. Here's our input and the first thing we have to do is read our accelerator. Now let's take a look at what we need for this accelerator. Well we need the accelerator that's here and then we need the position. If we have a look here it'll tell us what to do. The centers of the spheres within which to look for points. The position is going to be the position of every point. So we can take what's coming out of here, get its point positions, plug those in there. The next thing we're going to need is the radius. So that's the radius in which to look. And if we have a look at our Maya grid here on screen, that is one by one by one by one. So it's a one by one square. And if I go to my top view, find a greenie, you can see it's the distance between this and its nearest neighbors is quite a lot smaller than one. In fact, it's probably down in the 0 0.001 range. This radius will control how quickly our infection spreads because if it has to reach out to more neighbors, you get a bigger average and the infection spreads out faster. There's a couple of things we can do to make that easier. One of them is we can go back to when we scattered these points and make sure that there's a bit of an even distance between everything. In other words, we'd scatter with blue noise. Instead, what we're going to do is later on, we're going to animate the size of that radius so that it gets bigger after a certain frame. And it's another tool we're going to build that I'll show you when we get there. But for now, let's set quite a small radius. And because it's an important thing we're going to need to change, let's pop it out on the input so it's accessible from outside. And let's start the radius at 0.05. Back to our accelerator. Enable max number says, how many neighbors do you want to get? What's the maximum number of neighbors you want to get? If I leave this now, it's going to get every point within a 0.05 radius of this green one, which is going to be slow. So what I want to do is restrict that. And I want to restrict that to a number like five or six. So let's go for five, the lower the better. And then let's look at our output. And what we have here is an array of arrays. So that what this is outputting is every single neighbor for every single point. And it's using the index based on the accelerator. Let's just quickly double check that. Doesn't tell us, but it does tell us the indices are sorted by increasing distance from the sphere center. For every array in that array, the indices inside that array are listed from closest to further away. And there will only ever be five in each one. So what are we gonna do with this? What are we gonna do with this information? What are we gonna do with this data? Well, we're gonna loop through it inside the solver and inside that loop is where we're going to do what we need to do. So let's get that set up. So we're going to use a for each loop because a for each loop is multi-threaded. It runs in parallel. It's the fastest way to loop. There are some things we're going to need to do with this. And the first thing we need is the infection array. Because we're comparing and changing the infection array, we actually need that here. So let's get that. So this means that every time we run through the solver, it's going to grab whatever's infected and all of its values here. And that's going to need to go in our loop. And let's name things. And I'm also going to delete the max iterations. I want it to loop through everything that is fed into it. So because these are based on position as well, I'm going to need the point positions in the array like this. And I'm going to go in here and remove iteration target from that one and add it to this one. So we're about ready to start building our infection system inside this loop now. So because this is now the array target, you can see that it's gone from being a double array, array, array long, to just a single array, array long. These are the neighbors of this index from that array. So first off, let's get the current infection value. So the infection value for the point we're looking at right now in the loop. There it is. Let's name it. That's the first thing we'll need. And we'll also need the infection value of the neighbors. So to get the current inf infection value, we'll just use the current index. And to get the neighbors infection value, 
we'll use the neighbor indices. So right now we have the current infection and the neighbor infection. Let's keep going. And you remember I said that it's based on the distance of the particle from its neighbors? So we need to get an array of those distances. And we'll do that by using a very similar setup to what we've got here. We're going to get the current point in its position and the neighbor's points in its position. Excellent, now we've got our array. This array will probably be five. In fact, it will be exactly five items long, and it'll be the distance to each of the neighbors from the current point. And it's here that we want to maybe take a fraction of that distance. The radius controls how quickly the infection spreads through the points, but this value, that we're about to add a percentage of the distance or a fraction of the distance towards each of the neighbors, is going to control how much infection each neighbor receives. So if that fraction is 1, then it's going to receive 100% of the infection that it calculates as the average. If it's less than 1, it's going to only receive a part of that. And that means that if it starts at zero infection and it has 1, 2, 3 neighbors, one of them is fully infected. And we start that at 1, then our point, so this one here, will get one third infected because there are three neighbors and it's taking the average of each of them based on its distance. The higher this number, it will get more and more infected faster. And that, that's what we're going to use to control the size of our crystal, so it's quite important. What we need to do to get a fraction of this, the easiest way to do that is with a change range. And we did this before, I'm just going to do it really quickly again. So we've set that up, and you can see the fraction of distance is going into the two end. Remember that change range changes the range of this array from its start and its end point now to the start and the end point that you set. And I've set the start to zero. So the smallest in the array will become zero, and the largest will become whatever we set here. And this is effectively our fraction. We're reducing the range of this array, the distance array, down to these two numbers. We're going to take our neighbor infection values, and we're going to multiply that by whatever comes out of this change range, so our distances. This is our intensity by distance. And then we're going to add this array up, and we do that with a sum array. And we're just doing an average, so we need to divide this by the number of, need to, to divide this by the number of items in the array, and that's the number of neighbors. So now we have the weighted average of all of the neighbor's infection value. And all that remains to do now is to add that to the current infection value. So remember that this point is being looped through. It could be this one, or 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 this one. And as the infection spreads out, more and more points will get higher and higher averages and spread out as well. Okay, so that's the very basic infection solver. That's, that's the basis of it. Now we need to jump out into the loop. We've got a new infection value. And here's where our solver comes in handy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a new infection value. So the way this loop works, and it's a solver, so it checks to see if it needs to be reset, gets the infection value here, feeds everything into this loop where it calculates the new infection values, and then sets that on the way out. And then this will come back in through the feedback, retrieve those infection values again, go through it all again. And it'll keep doing that until it runs out of frames. So that is the very basis of the infection solver. So what we'll do is we'll plug in our infection solver to our color by property that we made before. We need to make sure that we've got a radius set up, we do, and a start frame of two. So it's not actually calculating just yet. It's, started, it's going to calculate on the next frame. We have a radius of 0 0.05, and what I need to do too is grab this fraction of distance and output that as well. So our fraction of distance of our infection solver, we can change this as well. So let's change that to, I don't know, 0 0.5 to start with. And we'll step forward a frame, and you can see it's already working. So as we step forward a frame, you can see the infection start to spread. So let's zoom out and see if we can see something a little better by playing it. 
And there we go. We've created a nice infection solver at a good speed. So we can change that speed by changing the size of the radius. So let's do that. We'll make it double the speed. Then it's infecting outwards faster. And you can see that the points are starting green, but they're going white very, very quickly. And then they go black. And the reason for that is if we were to check our infection values coming out of here, you would see that they are insanely high. They are so high, in fact, that they're looping back around to zero. Well, not zero, but they're giving the floating point engine a few problems. So that's the first thing we need to fix up. We, we have a working infection solver. There we go. We can even change how fast and how slow that solver is. And every time I go back to the beginning, I'm resetting the solver. So you can see that that's not moving very fast at all because the radius is very, very small and it's only finding things this close. Let's change that. The nice thing about this is you've got very quick feedback, especially if you've cased your points to start with. So basically what we need to do is either massively slow down the intensity. You can see it's still infecting, but it's not getting as intense as quickly. And depending on what we're going to want for our shot, this is probably not the best way to go. It looks good, but it's probably not the best way to go. So what we're going to do is cheat a little bit. First off, I'm going to clamp the output of this loop. So if we check these infection values, you can see that the max is already at 244. If we were to up our fraction again to back where it was, you can see this drive its way right through the roof really, really quickly because it's continually adding every time through the solver. So I'm going to just quickly throw a clamp on that. And let's say all I want for my size, this is what's controlling the growth. Clamping this will just control the color. It's either when it's got 0 0.01 of an infection, then it is infected. But we just don't want it to run through the roof. So I'm going to clamp that up to, let's say, 15. And that way, you still get the infection spread and the speed of that's quite nice. But the infection intensity and you can see it's almost gotten all of the points at this stage. You can come in and check here and it just wasn't quite fast enough. It isn't just stopping because of gaps. It might be stopping because of gaps there. We'll come back to that in a minute. That's something we'll need to fix. But our intensity is not going through the roof and that's, that's fine. And what I'm also going to do is set up a conversion from zero to one that we'll be able to use as our size for our infection. So let's do that. So now we're taking whatever value comes out of here, it doesn't matter what it is, and we're just converting that from 0 to 1. And I'm going to put that into a new property. And the reason I've called this emit is because not only are we going to use it later on, that or the infection value, whatever works best, but we can also use a 0 to 1 named emit later on when we render. We can give this to Arnold, and then we have a really nice way to say, okay, I'm this infected through to this infected. We could set up emission on that, which is why I called it emit. We could set up all kinds of things in Arnold on that. And so it's really good to get that set up now. We have built an infection solver. Go ahead, pause the video and get this looking the way that you'd like it to look. Play around with it. And then when I come back, I should have everything cached. And when I come back in, in milliseconds, I should have everything cached and we can go ahead and start talking about spreading this infection from the ground to everything else. I've cached everything inside a compound here. And one point I forgot to make earlier is apart from the moving grass, nothing else is moving. Everything else is static, including what we're infecting. So that means all we need to do is cache a single frame. And if we take a look inside the cache folder, you can see that these are all single frame caches. And that is just another optimization. It's just another way to speed things up. It means it loads the frame once on the first frame because it's frame 001. Speed is what we're after, speed and ease of use. And let's just go back to our infection real quick. The thing with the infection is, is that you have a couple of restrictions and a couple of things you need to overcome. And the first one is that we really want to get this nice sort of dendritic random spreading. And we do that by setting quite a low radius. But here's the problem. What happens is eventually that infection hits something that is too far away to spread, like in here. So we can overcome that by increasing our infection speed. But the more we increase our infection speed, the less it looks 
interesting. It's just circles at this point. So we have a couple of options here. We can just start slowly pushing that up until we get the best of both worlds. But even with that slight change, it's looking more circular than interesting and fractal. And you're still having issues over here where the density is lower. So what we're going to do is a really quick fix for that. And we're going to do it inside the infection solver. And inside the infection solver, what we're going to do is we're going to artificially edit the infection array. So here, where we set our first infected values at, at 1, and we could set that lower too, by the way. We can set that to quite a low number. What we're going to do is artificially add some seed points as we get further down the line. Because our goal here is to infect all of the grass, and it's the only thing in this shot that our director wants to be fully infected. Let's get our infection speed to where we like. It's going to be something like that, and we can take down our intensity speed as well. And see, this is really nice. But it's not getting us anywhere near the coverage we need. 0 0.05 might be a bit better. We're still getting the nice branching growth, which we want. We're getting quite a bit of coverage, but not obviously not all the coverage. So the way we're going to get around that is we're going to just add new infection points. Here's how we do this. Inside our solver, the first thing we do after we check to see if the solver is not being reset here is we get the infection array. So I can build another little bit of logic up here that quite simply works like this. So what this is, is giving me is every uninfected point, because this is the infection rate here, and remember that uninfected is zero. So now we have this big bunch of uninfected points. And so these are our uninfected points. What I'm going to do is every time through the server, we're going to pick some of those points at random, and we're going to infect them. And we're going to infect them outside of the loop by just setting something in this array. So let's just put this in a compound. And what we're going to do in here is really similar to what we did for the seed points out here. We're going to use this system where we use a sequence array and a random choice in that array. The sequence array will control how many we choose in the array. And the size of the array, which is this number of seeds in this case, will control how many extra points we add every time through the solver. So let's just copy these. So what we're doing here is we're checking to see if it's uninfected. If it is, we're finding all of the indices in that array that are uninfected, getting the size of that, using our sequence array to generate a certain number of points, and then getting a random value using that sequence between 0 and the array size. And then we need to output these indices we're going to use because we're working with indices. So, And this becomes our output. So now what we can do, let's just give it, say, one extra point. And remember, this is every time through the solver. Every frame, it's going to add an extra point of infection. And all we need to do is grab this infection array that we're getting and set a non-zero value for these indices. And now you can see how it's adding new infection points every time. And if we just up the number of infection points, So you've still got that nice dendritic looking growth, and now you're getting most of the points. And what we can also do, which we should do pretty soon anyway, because we're going to need it, is we should animate this value so that we can have it finding more points the further down the line we go than when we start. And this enables, enables us to keep our speed, keep it the patterns that we like, so this is one way to fix that problem. The other way to fix that problem is to animate our radius. So it's, it's brought us to the point where we need to make a quick animate compound. So as usual, I'll do that and we'll see how we go. What I'm going to do to start with though is I'm going to set our infection array back to what it was. I'm just going to 
cut these two out of the loop for now. So we're back to what we had. We've got our light and look working nicely, but it's not infecting fast enough. We'll go all the way back out here and let's build an animate property compound. So what this enables us to do is we take our frame from our time node. So this is whatever frame we're on and we change its range from whatever it is to between this and this. And then the output becomes this and this, making sure that we have clamp on so that before the start and after the end, it still doesn't change. For example, so start frame 100 and the end frame 150 to start with. Don't forget that we've got a shot camera and our shot camera at 150 is quite a way away, which is good. So we're going to need to start seeing these by 150 easy. Our start value, we're going for our infection speed. So our infection speed starts at 0 0.05 and that, that's pretty nice. I like that. That's giving us the nice patterns we want and things like that. But let's increase that so that by 150, we've got an end value of 0 0.15. And and we will make sure that our animation curve has a nice curve to it like this. The only problem here, and then we plug this into our infection speed. You can see that our three seed points in here sit around doing nothing and then take off once the radius gets high enough. And if we were to look at this on the shot cam, see how that looks. By the time they're starting to spread out, we're getting lots of crystals in the front. Yeah, we can use this or we can use the scattering of new points or we can combine the two to get the best result. So let's combine the two. So we've got an animation that starts at 0 0.05, ends at 0 0.15. I'm going to change that to 0 0.1. Let's just remove that curve for now. Let's see how that looks. And that gives quite a nice result up in the back there. So what I'm also going to do is just very quietly add a point each time around the solver as well, which we can just do by setting this back to one and plugging this into the infection array. We'll reset the sim. And there we go. We're getting all of our points filled in in quite a nice random looking fashion. The growth is quite random. What I can do too, is I can have this only work after a certain frame. So So by doing something like that, it's going to use these points up until frame 90, which is what we've set here. And then after that, it's going to start adding points. So this just gives the impression that the infection is starting slow, growing outwards in quite a nice fashion that we'll see because the camera's close. And once we pull a bit further back, the infection just accelerates away. And I'm happy with that. That's, that's kind of what I want to do. Let's just do a quick bit of cleanup. We're also still animating our property here. So this has now given us the tools to do the entire thing. Moving along, it's now time to work out how to get different objects to catch the infection. So what I've done is I've really quickly reworked the animate property. If we jump in here, I'll quickly show you through it. I'm taking the start frame and the end frame. And instead of literally changing the range to the values that I want, I'm changing it to zero to one and then evaluating the animation curve upon it. So here's our animation curve and it's going to affect this. So at this point, this is coming out zero to one. I'm using that as the fraction of a lerp between the start value and the end value. And this just gets us a little more accuracy and also gets us a proper working animation curve. And what I'm going to do is I'm also going to use this, even though this is outputting a float, I can use this to animate just about any setting that I want. So I'm going to make a copy of that and I'm going to change this output to long. So long integer like this. I'm going to change my start value to zero, my end value to three, start frame to 90 and end frame to 
Oh, I don't know, one, 130. We'll try that. I'm going to plug this into the extra seed points. So now not only am, am I animating my infection speed, I'm animating how many extra seed points happen after frame 90. Let's see how that looks. And now you can see that not only does the infection accelerate like it did before, but I can zoom right in here, see if I can find an uninfected point, and I pretty much can't. So that's that's doing exactly what I want. I'm very happy with that. And that's going to be our main infection. Okay, so let's build the secondary infection. We're going to build that from this infection. The difference is, instead of setting up seed points and a random chance or whatever like that, what we're going to do is use another infection to drive this infection. So first off, let's duplicate this. And I'm going to break some connections just so that we've got a clean slate to start with. What we need to do here is a couple of things. We need to connect our new object. And in this case, we're going to use the house. The house turns up because this has display on. In fact, the house will probably generate some infection. There we go. So that's another good example of the modular nature of this. This is still working when we plug a different object into it. Like I keep banging on about throughout the whole workshop, it's all about breaking it into modules and then just using those over and over again. So we need to insert our ground infection. If I turn that off and do a quick scrub, this is our ground infection with its infection property working. So this becomes what I like to call our base object. So let's dive in here and start making some changes. And the first big change we're going to make is that we don't want to set any seeds. So our infection array can just go straight in to there. And at this point in time, it's going to, everything's going to remain zero because it just sets the entire infection array to zero and passes it in. So if I play that, we'll get infections on the ground, but absolutely nothing on the house, which is exactly what we want. Now we can start deleting properties because we don't need them anymore, but we'll keep our controls. And now here's how we're going to have one object transfer its infection to another. I'm going to take the base object here, and we're outside the solver right now, and I'm going to merge it. Merge the geometry. We'll need to set that as fan in. And I'm going to merge it with our new object that has had its infection array set. So in this case, it's the house. So we're merging those. And I'm going to feed both of those into the accelerator. This is the first step. What I'm also going to do is grab this object, and pop it in there because we're going to merge out here and we're going to merge in there and if it works we'll use this merge for both but for now let's just do it the long way so we jump in here this is our object coming in here's our feedback reset these three here which is what we want remember this is our setup for setting random points later on let's move that out of the way for now basically what we really want to do is we want to find all of the points that are infected in the merged object including the points on the ground and the new merged object with the house so the first thing we're going to need to do is merge the object again so let's take this in and we'll and the reason we're merging it twice is when we merge it outside we're merging it just to set up the accelerator just to make it faster to search in radius in here this object remember changes every frame and so if we were to just set it outside of the solver and bring it in that may or may not help us with our infection values but in here we know that this changes every frame and this changes every frame so we're making a new object to perform things on both aspects of that object are changing. So here's our next merge. And we're going to replace the get point position here and this set geo property. So everything else feeds into the solver, okay? Same as it was before. But what we're doing now instead, and let's just do a quick rename here. We'll use this one. This is the where it gets the infection. Show name. And change the name to infection array. One problem we're going to have, however, is this is now performing it on all of the points. We don't want all of the points out. What we want going outwards is we want just the house. So just this object going out, which means we have to delete the points that we've added before we output. And let's be very careful here and make sure that these two are round the other way. It's very important that we have our main object come in first and then our base object come in second, because now we're going to build a system for removing those points. So what this is doing is it's getting the point count of the merge, so that's every single point that we're working on, and it's getting the point count of the base object coming in. It's then subtracting the point count from the base object of the base object from the merged object and using that in a sequence array to start that that becomes our start point of a sequence array. So what this is doing is building a sequence array that starts where these points start, and then we're going to use this sequence array to delete points later. So then all we need to do is on output delete points. 
and connect our new sequence array to that. So what this guarantees will happen is that the house points come in, they get merged, things happen to them, so sample point happens, the for each loop happens, that calculates the infection. But before we go out again, we're deleting all of the points that we merged in here the first time. So let's see how this works. You can see right there that the green infection on the ground is now spreading to the house. We've kept all of our settings from our original. You can see that the infection is accelerating there and it's growing up the house and the step in a really good way. We do have one issue though, and that issue is that it's really only infecting the house here and later on here. What we'd really like it to do is infect the house here and maybe here as well. The problem here is that the points are too far apart. Now we've got a, we've got a little bit of a quandary here because if we go in here and increase our infection speed, which controls our radius, and let's really increase that to 0.5 and just let it play. First thing you can notice is that it's gotten a lot slower and that's because it's searching in a much bigger radius. So a lot slower. So, you know, that's probably out. So the easiest way to fix that is literally to move these points closer in. And we've already done that in our point setup. But we're going to run into a problem here is that we're running on a cache of the house. So we can either get our point setup working and recache, and we'll do that anyway. To get everything sorted out and just, just to eyeball it, what I'm going to do is bypass this cache go straight into the infection. And it's always prudent just to check to see that it works. So now that, that means that I can go back to my scatter prep shape. So we can, we've can we got two choices. We can expand the house points or we can push the ground points closer to the house. And that's, that's the more sensible option. So let's go up to our ground points. If you remember, or you can go back in the video, we built some arrays and we built them based on things like the roof tiles. And here's the scale in place that we had for the roof tiles. And this is the number we used for the roof tiles. So if I change this number, can see that they got a little closer and we've got some points on the inside so let's try and minimize that in the inside points as much as possible and let's just check to see how close we're getting now that's probably still not close enough make it bigger that might be enough to cause an infection and because we're starting to get points on the inside I'm going to actually make a killing object and show you guys how to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the walls of the house to build a killing object and that way I can delete all of the points inside the house no matter where they are. So this is an array with all of the objects we need coming through, merging, getting the direction to camera, then it sets the house geo on those points and out it goes. So what we really need to edit is this. So we need to find the walls object in the house. So I'm going to switch off my, my switch on my scatter prep, switch off my instancing. So now I can actually look at the points that I'm working on, which is great. Let's turn the house display back on. Now the pink points is what I'm looking at. And what I need to do is find some way to destroy these points that are inside the house. So I'm quickly going to find the walls object in this array. And lucky for me, it's the first object in the array. So that's pretty good. So what, what I'm essentially trying to do is find every point that is inside this. So, you know, what's, what's the best way to do that? So now what we have is we have the just the ground points and the house shape we want to use to kill those ground points. Possibly the best way to do this is to make a killing object outside in Maya based on this. And that's that's pretty easy to do. Just because we're doing this in Bifrost doesn't mean we can't leverage what Maya can do for us. So what I've done here is I've built an object inside the set. And what this is doing is it's just filling most of the space inside the walls of the house. You can just see the walls of the house there. And I built it by taking the, the house walls, removing all of these faces and extruding this down. I removed these windows as well, removed those, and just took the roof area and extruded it straight down and then retopologize. And what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to use that as a kill object inside my ground scatter here. And then I'm going to make some adjustments so that the ground scatter is just a little bit better. Let's let's get onto that real quickly. So first thing I'm going to course I'm going to need to do is I'm going to take my kill object and I'm going to hide it. Let's build a real quick import and volume setup and then I'll explain it.
So what I've done here is I've converted this to a volume. I've made sure that volume is a level set. So this is like a VDB, which means it adds a attribute to the volume called voxel signed distance. And what that is, is a float array that measures the distance inside and outside the volume. So basically, if the distance is greater than zero, it is outside the volume. If the distance is less than zero, it is inside the volume. So what I'm doing here is I'm sampling the volume sign distance. I'm looking for anything greater than zero and finding anything that isn't greater than zero. I could have just used less than here and used this as true, but this just works just as well. And to example that, you can see here, if I show our kill object again, there's our kill object. Let's go to wireframe so we can see it a bit better. There's our kill object. If I switch this over to true, then it's going to delete everything outside of the volume. But false, it's going to delete everything inside it. And this is really good because it just gives us a really quick way of removing anything inside of it. Taking the indices that come back false in the array of greater than and deleting points with them. And so it's just removing these points straight away. We can come back to where we were doing our adjustments in the scale in place here. And just looking, let's go for the top view. Now I can start pushing these points inwards without worrying about them going inside the house. So let's just do it this way until we get something that looks pretty good. Until we've got some good contact with the side here. And we have, this is going all the way into the house now. Let's just show the house points. I've probably been a little bit extreme here, but I want to see good contact all the way along there. And I'd like to get this one. working and that's that's pretty much what we want there we've got good contact all the way along that bottom wall and good contact all the way along this wall as well we've fixed up our points so that our house could get should get a better infection let's hide our kill object we don't need to see that and we're back to where we were so now we've got our ground input that's that's our first infection here and then we've got our house as well let's just rename this Okay, so I've made a few adjustments just to get things a little smoother and faster, and you should probably do the same. One of the big things I did is I've now recached everything. After we put in our cutout object, I've recached everything, and I have stopped for Bifrost from pulling on the other preparation. So now we're just running off caches. You can see here, here's the other graph coming in. Here's the string that we're pulling out, and these are the objects that we're getting uncached. But I have now recached everything, and you know how to do that. You just switch on the right for one frame at frame one, switch it off again, and then I've broken those connections. So if I need to go back to the other graph and do things, I can still do that, but I'm going to need to reconnect and recache. This is just making things faster. The other thing I've done to speed things up for us is I am, I am putting a compute on frame on any point object that I'm using. So right now I'm using the ground and I'm using the house and that's they're both just computing on the first frame. So it's just loading the cache and then not loading it again. It's only a tiny bit of speed that we're saving, but it is the difference between being painfully slow and able to actually work without having to stop and play blast all the time. Okay, so now we're back to where we were. We have our first infection solver and our second infection solver. And I've just taken some of the unused commands out, so out of the secondary infection. And let's have a look at that. And you can see the grass infection spreading as it was before. But now you can also see that it's passed itself onto the house and the house is now being infected. When it comes to shaping or art directing this, there's a couple of ways you can do it. The long and hard way is to keep changing your animation properties until you're happy. So this is just going from 0.07 to 0.25 with a, with a certain animation curve and things like that. That's the hard way and, and the more naturalistic random way. If you wanted to manually set off an infection at a point, or something along those lines. You could drop in a locator, do another points from radius, and just set those points that you wanted infected in the infection array before it goes into the salt. Same if you wanted to make some points in a path already infected. What we're continuing with is transferring the infection from the ground to other things. Now, again, back to the modularity, the theme of this workshop. I have an infection and I now have a secondary infection. All going well, I could use this again to do the trunk. So let's try that. Let's do our prep. We'll find our trunk and compute on frame. So we're taking our trunk cache and just computing it on the first frame so it doesn't work by re trying to read that file again in the next frame. Basically, I'm going to duplicate this and try and get the trunk to work as well. It should just work. I want the trunk to be a different color. In fact, I want them all to be very different colors so I can see the difference and see the growth as it goes. And that means what I should do is take the display color here and put that out to the input. 
and that way I can let's see this is yellow 110 I can change that to say magenta and that way I'll be able to see what's going on now this is at the moment coming from the house let's take it from the trunk and because we've set that compute on frame nothing will happen unless you're on frame one so now we've got the house the grass and the trunk I'm going to really quickly see if this works let's save saving is good there's our first infection. So this is working, but just after I'd spoken about setting up art directed points and saying we weren't going to do it, we're going to do it for the trunk. We're going to do it for the trunk mainly because it is so much bigger than everything else and we want to just give it a helping hand along because at the final frame, which is here, I'd like to see this stuff being infected as well as this stuff. So I'd like to see some crystals running up the tree as well as running down the tree from here. Now we're going to do a lot of setups with our and the speed of our animation and things like that. I'll just really quickly show you how to set up an art directed infection. Let's name any everything before we go ahead. So what we want to do is we want to be able to set some points in and around the trunk so that the infection starts in different places simultaneously, both caught from the grass and also from up here so it grows down and maybe from out here so it grows that way as well. So to do that, I'm going to throw down a locator. And I think I'm going to need maybe four of these. So, so I've got these four. And we're going to follow our method for getting things into Bifrost again, which involves the node editor. Here's our Bifrost graph, but it's the scatter prep shape. What I need is the instancing shape. Now we're not animating these, these locators, so we're going to be using this, the world position from the shape to go into Bifrost. And let's very, very quickly set up some inputs for that. So I'm going to make a new input. And I'm going to make sure that what's coming into the inputs is a vector 3. And there we go, we have four inputs. So I could have also done an array of inputs. So we do it from what we're trying to plug it into this time and we make sure that this is set to fan in and then run it to the input. It's called extra seeds. If we come back to our node editor. So here's the extra seeds and you can see that it's an array, extra seed zero. So So now we have our locators coming in and it's an array. So we'll need to do array type stuff in there before, but before we do anything else, let's place those locators. What we need to do now is one more sample and radius and we're going to do it on this stream here because this is where we're setting our start infection and what we need to do is add the points close to these locators and this that makes it really quite simple. And you can have a look up there, see that one's being infected immediately as well. So we can adjust things now to our liking for art direction. We can make sure that we've got max number on so it's not selecting a huge amount. This is where you can just rely on your infection speed starting radius or you can go ahead, break that connection. And you see this jumped up to quite high and we'll set this to a smaller number. 
And you can see how our max number protects us here. If I turn that off and get our radius to quite a large number, then you've got quite a lot of points you're already dealing with to start with. So let's just make sure that this is set to something like six, which is what the other, other solver runs on. Let's just shrink that radius just a little bit. And this is also happening on all of them. So we've really just got seed points just starting up. So that one is actually outside of the radius, which means we can give it, we need to give it a little bit of help. Okay, so that's that's how you add additional seed points. Look there, I'm going to pause the video and, and do a quick play blast and I'll be right back. And immediately you can see the problem. This is now from our shot camera. These are infecting very early and very, very quickly. So now we need to adjust the settings on our trunk. And this again comes back to the making a module to do it. And we have, we've made two. We've made the secondary infection module here and we've also made well, the animate property module. And that's what's making this so fast. So. And we want our start frame, like we want this to start a bit later. So let's leave that at 60. We'll leave the end frame at 120 as well, but we'll start this at zero, which means the radius of the infection is zero up until frame 60, and then it starts to climb. And that might actually do what we need. Notice that I've got no points here. It's because I interrupted the play blast and it won't recalculate until we get back to frame one. So I'll do another play blast. I'll be back shortly. So now you can see the points just sit there until frame 60, and then they start to spread. So that's pretty good, that works. Now all that remains is to do the branches coming off the trunk, the needles coming off those branches and the grass themselves. Because we've got three modules now, this is just gonna be a matter of copying and pasting and setting up. So I'm gonna go away and set up everything except the final moving grass. And here we have the final output. So I've done a little bit of tweaking and basically just use the same method as we did before by copying and pasting. The branches and needles both have uh, custom start points, just like the trunk does. And that just allows me to tweak the animation a little more. So this is where we're at. What we do from here is we need to work on the grass. And the grass is a lot bigger than even all of these points combined. So we've got a different method for that, which I'll show you in just a minute. What happens now is we use the cache node we made to cache all of these out. And we include their emit property, their infection property, their position. Those are the only three attributes we need. And that's what you need to think about when you're caching something for output, especially to another department. Only give them what they need and keep it as fast as you can. So at this point, we're going to say it's done. Our manager's happy with it. They like the way it works. And now we're going to go ahead and put some crystals on it. So here we have, if I just select everything, we have our ground infection. That we're going to leave alone for the moment. We have our house, our trunk, our branches, and our needles. So at this point in time, what we're going to do is, instead of using the display flags, we'll turn all of these off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to merge all of this geometry. Now it's quite good to just run this out to an output. See, they've all disappeared. So let's run this out to the output right now. And we'll just check to make sure that we've got absolutely got the properties we need. And these are the two big ones. And point position is always important because without the point position, <laughs> you've got no points. But emit and effect infected are the two big ones. The emit's going to go through to the rendering to allow color change over time or glow or whatever, whatever the look dev demands, basically. The infected is what we're going to use for our crystals. Once we've got it to this point, all of these geometries are merged out. We need to give these a property that tells us what they are further down the line. So for example, you wanted to use different kinds of crystals for the house and the tree. So you might want to say use pointy ones for the tree, but square ones for the house. Then being able to distinguish inside the cache which points are which is going to be absolutely invaluable. So let's really quickly set that up. So now you can see that I've set these up just like we did our cache when we were preparing our points. I've set these up with a named property that we can use. There are, there are other ways to do this, but I find the ability to have a look at what's what and to build a compound to split them all up into whatever they are 
to be really, really useful. So we're just preparing the cache. This is now going to give us zero when it's not a branch, but one when it is a branch, zero when it's not in the house, but one when it is, etc., etc. This is what we're going to cache. So we have 127,000 points here. Yeah, 127,692 points. These nodes are providing the infection values across the entire shot. And that's what we're caching. So this time we're not going for a single frame cache, we're going for a full cache. So we just need to go and grab one of our cache files. And again, it's reusing the modules we've already built. So we've already built the point cache. Great, let's use it again. We've already built the ability to split them back up into their own separate point objects. We'll use that again too later on. Following the theme of the entire workshop, it's all about building something once and using it over and over and over again. So in this case, this, this one's going to go into object to cache. And we need to make sure that we've got our properties right here. Right now, if I was to set that off, we're just caching out point position. But what we need to cache out is pretty much everything. So what we're going to do here for the quick way to do that is just put in a star. Cache all properties. And of course, for the cache to work, we need to, we're going to need to plug it into an output. So now I need to play the entire thing through, which I will do, in, and then I'll come back and we'll work on the grass. So here we are back with the grass. Now everything is cached out nicely. It's been tested and looked at, and that's all now ready to go on to having crystals uh, instanced on them, and it's carrying all the information it needs to drive those crystals. What we have to do now is do the same for this, and the problem with this object that I've found through bitter experience is that it has rather a lot of points. Trying to run a secondary infection like we did for the house and everything like that, very, very difficult. Well, not very difficult, very easy actually, but very slow. And the reason it's so slow is literally this. So we, we're sampling 12 neighbors here. So we have a, a neighbor sample of 12. So if you take 2 million and multiply that by 12, you get 24 million points every time it does a frame. The way, the best way to get around this is simply not to use a secondary, but to use a primary infection. Again, with modular stuff and with procedural stuff, the really, really nice thing about this is if I copy and paste this, it's going to keep its settings and we can see how it works on the grass. The important thing to keep the settings for are the seeds inside of it so that the ground and the grass are being infected at the same time. The other thing we need to do is we need to make sure that what's being infected in the grass scene are the bottommost points. And if we take a look at our properties on the grass cache that we've made, we've got a point ratio and that's, that's how we're going to do this. We want the grass to infect from the bottom up. So what we basically want to do is set up a animation of seed points for this, the same seed and everything, but just keep slowly adding seed points all the way through and make sure those seed points are on the bottom. And then the infection system that we've already set up will, will take care of growing them up to the top. Okay, so let's, let's get started on that. The reason it's a lot slower is that it's calculating and drawing 2.06 million points every time we want to have a look at it. And it's not that slow for that many points. It's doing pretty well, but it's still slower than just working on the 40,000 points we were using per object up here. Uh, this is 20 times the size of all of these combined, basically. So let's just check what we've got going in here. We've got an animated number of points here, and we've got an animated radius, which is also cool. We can, because we've used these up here, we can just use them down here later. But let's, let's just get this working to start with. I'm going to leave most of these settings alone, but I'm going to change this up to quite a big number. 4,500 because it was 45 to start with, all good. You can see here that extra seed points in the animation starts at zero and ends at three, and our extra seed points over here is one. So let's just set that to zero for now. And so now let's dive in. And what we're going to need to do is work in both the generate seed points and the extra points. So we're just going to need to set up a little bit of logic in the extra seed points and the number of seeds. And this is the logic that's going to do it. And to get the point ratio, I'm going to find anything less or equal to 0 0.5535, which is a very specific number, possibly might have done this before, <laughs> and find everything true about that. This number is going to change, so let's put this out so we can adjust it on the outside. So we really need to see this working. So what I'm going to do, just temporarily, is I'm going to disconnect our generate seed points and connect our indices into here. So we can also do some sensible stuff like checking the size of this array that's coming out. So this should just be all of the very low value point ratios. To get that to work, I'm going to need to jump out and turn on my display. So things are going to slow down here and there, and I'll probably do a bit more speeding up or cutting of the video as we go. So bear with me. 
and you can see straight away that's worked really well. It's showing me all of this, all of the seed points. Let's uh, let's just jump back in here quick, all the way in because I want to change my size. There we are, we've just made that a bit smaller. And the reason we've done that is because I just want to double check that it's not picking up too many at the bottom. They are all at the bottom. This will be the, the, the array of points we'll choose our seeds from as we animate up. You see it's, it's picking maybe the first two or three. So let's just adjust that. And I'm just going to drop the size of that down by around about half. Now it's selecting less points on the bottom. So that's where we're going to start. So at the moment, this is generating all of the seed points and we don't really want to do that. So we're going to actually not use this system that we built. But what we want to do is we want to pick a number of seeds randomly from this array. And let's just see how these extra points are working inside of here. So there's secondary random infections. That's just picking randomly from those points. So that might be what we need to do. It might be the easiest way to do it and, you know, preserve all of the stuff we've already done. So I should just be able to just pop that back in there. And again, because we've done everything in a modular fashion, I can mix and match as we go, as long as I preserve the proceduralism of it. So what's happening here, if we go to our secondary random infections, is it's actually generating an array and then picking some numbers from it. So what we basically need to do is replace this array that it generates with the array we want to bring in. So let's work on it. Let's work with that and see what we can do. So I ran away and fixed it. What was different, or what I'd got wrong, is I was trying to output straight from this array to the infection array. And what happens there is this is just random values. You can see that this, is, this would be our starting infection. You can see it's halfway up the stalks and all of that kind of thing. What I'd forgotten to do was get from the point ratio array to plug into our new infections. So when I do that, give it a second, it's now just picking on the bottom of it. And I've got this set up to show me very, very bright colors so we can see it better. Let's get that back to 0 0.2, which is where we were with the other one to start with and we'll just we'll adjust our number of seed points just uh, maybe a little bit slower than this but we'll leave everything else the same and what we'll do is just I will go away and play blast this and we'll see what it looks like so this is doing pretty much everything we want it to do what it's not doing is it's not going all the way to the end because we would like our grass to be fully clevered in crystals by the time we get to the end of the shot so that's easy we've done that before we did that with the ground points. We're just going to reconnect this random secondary random infections, but I'm going to delete that from there and just reset this up as it was before. So there we go. We need the array size of the uninfected points. We should be able to do exactly what we did with the ground using the extra, extra points here. It's extra seed points. It needs to be hooked back up because we deleted it. And if you remember, that was the one that controlled things after frame 90. So if it's before frame 90, it won't add any more seed points. If it's after frame 90, it will. What we'll need to do here is just, just test that. So we'll set that up to be one per frame. Yeah, one per frame. And we'll reset everything. And I will go and do a play blast now. I'll be back shortly. And here we have it. Now it doesn't completely fill all the grass, but close enough. Seriously, it's going to give us the look. It looks good and it's growing at a good pace. So what happens now? Now we cache. And once we've cached, we combine it with our other cache, which we've still got in here. And I'll show you that in a second. And then we're going to start growing crystals on here. Okay, so let's stop that. Just close that down. So if you remember right here, we've got merge geometry, which is great. So now what we need to do is we just need to merge this infection in with it. And to do that, of course, we're going to need to set some geo on it. Again, just for our render artists so that they have, they, they are able to differentiate between house, branches, trees, trunk, grass, whatever. The more options we can give them, the better. So just the same as we've done up here, we're setting an integer property and we're setting it to one for moving grass. So now last step before we can actually start getting crystals going. Add this to the geometry merge here because it's now got its property sorted out I say along with everything else. And then we are going to recache this array. So I will pause the video again and come back once that is done. So here we go. What we're looking at here is the result of our cache. Our cache has come in. Everything's looking fine. What I'm doing here is I'm just displaying based on a property. Color by property, which is another little module I put together, which just takes the geometry, what property you want to display and what color going to display it with. And as you can see, our infection has worked really well. There's the infection on the grass and it's climbing up the house. There it is on the trunk. You can see it's starting there and up there as well on the branches and the trunk. All we've got left to do now is 
the instances. So let's quickly get on with that. So what I've done so far before we've started is I've brought in the cache. There's the cache loading there. Taken the first in the array because as I was saying before, it's a cache with only one object in it. And just because we output the cache with all of the properties enabled, this has now come in with a big list of properties and it also has point size. Now point size is really, really important for, for instancing. So is point scale. So what I've just done here is I've just erased the point size property. I'm going to take what we've got and we'll build some instances. Now this is of course what happens. This is of course what happens when you instance no geometry. So let's turn that off for a second. And here are three instances I made earlier. Whatever you do is up to you, but for me, what I've done is basically just made some very, very simple crystal shapes and given them a very gentle bevel. Whatever you wanted to use for your instances is fine. Uh, these are just the shapes I'm using. It's completely up to you and your art director what, how you want your crystals to look. You may have some geometry provided. You may have to make your own like I did. With that being said, we now have instances. So let's put these into a graph. Now, we're not going to do the same sort of shenanigans we did with scattering and instancing the grass. I mean, we can. You can still choose by probability. You can still do things based on distance and proximity and all of those cool things you can do with instancing, which is really good. But in our case, because there's so many crystals, I'm just going to let them stay as they are. So now we actually have some instances put in. Let's take a look at what they look like. The very first thing we notice is that they're all very big and they're all facing in exactly the same way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the graph for a second and I'm just going to throw in a couple of good instance tools that, we, that we've used before. Randomize the scale and randomize the rotation of the crystals. And that's a bit better scale all around. The main problem, of course, is that the grass should be visibly a lot smaller. And the best way to do that is to build another module. And I've already built one here. I'm going to build it again just so we can all see it. So first thing I'll do is I'll switch the graph off again. And I'm just going to reverse the positions of the rotation and scale. Just simply change which way they are because... That way I can do the scale last and I can do all of these things I need to do. By the way, I've set the rotation to full 360 rotation on all axes. You can, if you like, of course, change the seed to get a different result. And the scale is 0 0.0125 to 0 0.0125. And that's because that's the scale that looks best. This looks pretty good for the house and the trunk of the tree. Doesn't look so good for the grass and really doesn't look good for the smaller needles and things. So let's, let's make some adjustments real quick. So now I'm just checking the properties to see to find all of the ones that have moving grass on them. So I'm using the find all array in array method that we've used before. This is looking for everything that has a moving grass property equal to one. And then it's finding everything that's true in that array. And it's going to give us all of the indices of the moving grass, which is which is what we want. So now we can take our point scale. We can use those indices to get the scales we want to adjust from the array. And now we need to make the adjustment. And then we need to put these back into our point scale array. Now all we need to do is set the point scale with the new values. So now if I change this value, this multiplication value to say 0 0.1, you can see that it's scaled all of the grass points down to one tenth. We could possibly stand to go a little bit bigger. We have random rotations, we have random scale values, and we've managed to get our grass smaller than everything else. So now that we've done that, we can make a compound out of it. And this is going to become our adjust scale by property. There are a few things we should probably put out to the input so that we can do this for many things. The property is the first one. So 
we just need to type in what property we want and also the scaling value. So how much bigger or smaller it is. And then we can get rid of this float. And so now we should basically be able to use this for any property we like. Although I have a feeling I possibly shouldn't have put the randomized point scale in there. So let's fix that real quick. Plug our point rotations back in and just put our point scale in as an input. So this should allow us to do this to scale any element by name. So we'll come back out here and let's Now there's one thing we haven't quite done. This is just getting the look of the instances right. So let's let's just keep going on that and then we're going to add the the scale animation later on. So what I'm also going to do is I'm going to take the the ones in the needles and I'm going to do the same thing. We should be able to scale down everything that has that has that value of needles on it. So that's got that working as well. Possibly we could make them even smaller. But good for now. So let's now that we've got the, the look we want kind of right. The, the other thing that would be really nice to do is just randomly have a much bigger crystal, say twice the size. Well, there's a couple of ways we could do it. We could adjust the distribution so that because this is a random scatter, this is randomization. We could adjust the distribution so that at 0.995 it shoots up to three or something. Or we could just do it with this array. So let's let's quickly do it with the array. So I'm going to need the array size and then I'm just going to need to choose a percentage of those and double them. So let's do that. So there you go. Now you can see some of them are very, very big, very, very big crystals, just to give you some idea. Now it's just time to tweak and then we'll get the animation working. So I think the ones on the house are a little big and aren't quite have enough spread. So let's get this down to 0 0.1. You can see everything shrink and possibly even smaller, 0 0.08. That, that's looking better. Don't forget we won't be seeing all of this. And you can see that it's kept all of our random scales. The needles are thinner, the grass is thinner. This is going to all look a lot better when we get it moving. So let's get it moving. Before I do that, I'm just going to wrap this up in a new compound. We'll feed the seed out so that we can make changes if we want to. And we'll also feed the number it has to be greater than out so that we can change the number of them. So now if we, for example, change this to 0 0.6, we should get quite a few bigger ones. You can see that they all just jumped up. Here we go. We're just getting nice little larger crystals, just at varying areas. Not too many. Let's get this animation going. Basically, what we need to do to get the animation going is take the infected value of the points coming out. And there's, these are going to have an infected value. And what we want this to do, this infected value, is drive the scale. We're randomizing the point scale here. And I think the best way to do this would be to get the infected value and convert that infected value to a zero to one range. And so now we can apply this as a multiplier to our final point scale here. And because the infected value is cached and changes, this should result in growth. So what I'll do now is I'll pause the video and go away and make a play blast and come back and show you what that looks like. Okay, and we're done. Now all that remains is to output this for our render artist. 
Because we're using Bifrost, and Bifrost and Arnold play really well together, really we can just deliver this file. We can deliver the instances without baking. We can tell our render artist that delivery is the Bifrost graph that they're to use. And that leaves them free to make any adjustments they need because they'll see that I'm adjusting my property and they can they know that they can duplicate this module and change other properties as well. So at the moment I'm just using moving grass. I could they could change the house properties, they could rebuild this entire thing if they need to. So really to finish everything off, I just need an output. Connect that up and it's done. It's ready. We just save it and we deliver to our render artist. So that's it. That's how you build a modular crystal growth system in Bifrost. I've tried to make this workshop applicable to a studio scenario where we are caching our outputs all the way through with the exception of the last instances. The reason I haven't cached the instances, and I could, is to give flexibility to the render artist. If the render artist comes back and says, I need you to cache this, it's not a problem. I'll cache it, set it off. And we can go from there. Basically, I've tried to keep it so that we build things in modules. To begin with, we scattered the points on the ground, and they were going to be the, the points to grow our grass from and take our, our master infection. So then we worked out how to do the grass, we instanced those, we baked all of that down, and we cached it. From there, we built the points for the rest of our set. So we built our house, our tree, the branches of the tree, the needles of the tree. We built those points, we cached those. From there, we built an infection solver on the ground plane, which was going to control most of everything else. We got that working, and we cached that. We then took that and set off the secondary infections on the house, the tree, the branches, the needles. Got that to where we liked it, we cache that too. Lots of caching here. You can you can see a theme coming through. You can also see that we're building it in modules. So beginning scatter, beginning instances, then set scatter, then instances scatter. So that's where we scattered on the grass because it was moving. Then infection solver. And again, it's all modular. It's all like we have our scatter prep file over here. We have our instancing main over here. And then we have our delivery over here. And in each Bifrost, you've got the same module being used over and over and over again. We did the main infection to the secondary infection, tertiary infection. And then we used the main infection again to run our grass work. We then merged everything into one big point cache. And that's what we took into our delivery. And at each stage, at each the end of each module, we're caching it down and using that. Because even though it's going to be a pain if my if my art director or my visual effects supervisor comes back to me and says, hey, uh, actually, we don't want to scatter on the roof. It's not going to be that much of a pain because we can go back to that point in the file and then run the caches again. And they will all just ripple through. It's the beauty of proceduralism and it's the beauty of keeping it modular and clean. All right, so thank you very much for coming to my workshop. Stick around for the questions and answers because I'll be here to answer your questions and maybe question your answers. And uh, yeah, have a really good time. See ya. And there we go. That was pretty much everything I recorded for FMX. It's around about two hours and 40 minutes of stuff that I sliced down to one hour. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for sticking around to the end or jumping to the end if that's what you've done. I really appreciate you guys watching all of this. Before I go, I just want to say a quick thank you to everybody in my team at Autodesk who have been wonderfully supportive and helped me through making this. That's about all. There's no Academy Award speeches or anything. So I hope you enjoyed it and um, on to the next thing. Thanks a lot. Bye.